This is a Geo podcast. And this is Michael talking with Jim Johnson on the last day of May 2019. Um, so, uh, Jim, it, it's, it, it, it seems to me that this AWC5 mm. is like a big moment in your, I'm going to use the word career. Um, thus, <laughs> to use the word loosely, <laughs> right? <laughs> career, um, our life's work. I mean, it's, right. it, it, it's uh, and and so more of a passion than a career, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, therefore, it's it, it's it, it, it's some way in which is really central <clears throat> to your whole life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so. Um, Mm. What got you into the field? Mm. What was there about the field? What was there some way in which you were searching? Yeah. Or whatever it yeah. was that... Mm. What, uh, anything, you know, your personal background and history, yeah. you know, like your parents may have been red parents and you went to all the <laughs> red uh, <laughs> summer camps and, you know, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, it does go back to my family of origin, I think, and um, there's a lot more to it than that, but I do think it starts there, although I wouldn't say my parents were Reds, they were progressives in the, right, really late 50s, into the 60s and mm-hmm. 70s, and, um, but it's important to note, I think, that what what drove them to be progressives was... Um, was really just an overriding sense of fairness. It was like they're, they're very different people, but that's one thing that they were both very committed mm-hmm. to. They were both, they are both misfits in their own way. And, um, and so for them, there was, there's a natural sensitivity to um, people who are marginalized and a, a, a passion for fairness. And my mother grew up in really severe rural poverty and um, is, for, uh, is Acadian, which was very much of a, in Maine, is ver- second-class wow. citizens in the 50s, right? So she very much felt the prejudice, um, really through the, f- the 40s and the 50s. Um, so there's a sensitivity there to the, uh, the underdog for both of them. And, um, and that naturally led them when the civil rights movement started happening. They were just like, well, of course, you know, people of color should have equal rights. Who could be against that, right? And it was just a no-brainer for them because they're coming from this fundamental thing about let's have a level playing field for everybody. Let's be fair first, mm. right? And um, and my my father is too too free of a spirit to really be all that employable. And so after a few years working for a big corporation, three, he was, that job was arranged for him through family connections, he struck out on his own with a small business. And that was just his way of coping with his own nonconformity, basically. And, um, and, the, and they, still, they still run a little business out of their house. It was like made, sometime in the 50s he did that, late 50s. And it's been that way since then. So that's the key thing, I think, is unlike a lot of progressives who came up at that time, I grew up in an environment of small business, right? And all the kids had to work in the business. And we had, um, we saw how the money was made constantly, right? And um, our business, our family business was always a do-it-yourself operation. You could say it was a very tangible form of economic self-determination, okay? Mm-hmm. And so that was always very, very much intertwined with progressive values in the civil rights movement, and the anti-war movement that happened at that time. And, and my parents' house was a hub for local activists. And so there were interesting people coming through the house all the time. They were very egalitarian, maybe too egalitarian, in their child-rearing philosophy. And so us kids were included in those conversations. We were encouraged to sit in and listen and ask questions 
during these very big high-minded discussions between progressive activists that used to happen in our living room all the time. And so that was just the culture of my upbringing. And, um, and it could be, you know, this being the 60s and 70s, it could be very tribal at times. Um, and so that really had a huge effect on me. And particularly the heyday of that period was between, for me, between the ages of 7 and 11 or so, which is, I think were very impressionable times for me. So for me, that was my lived experience. And, but especially that, that, you know, your economic enterprise is something that's local, it's hands-on, mm -hmm. it's do-it-yourself, it's participatory, and it's transparent. And, and it's completely aligned with progressive values. And so, you know, fairness and inclusion and very dead serious about social justice. And so, to me, those things have always gone together. So naturally, when I struck out on my own, you know, one of the first things I did was I found a food co-op. And that was, I just... You know, my mom joined the food co-op. I was working the volunteer hours on behalf of the family so we could get our 40% discount. And, um, and it, was, it was just a natural fit. Mm -hmm. And through the community of people that I found through that food co-op, I found all sorts of other avenues. I found nonviolence training. I found anti-nuclear activism. I found uh, Quakerism movement for a new society, um, you know, all sorts of alternative threads. And, and this was a period, even it was the late 70s, but to a certain extent, you know, the country was still shaking off a lot of the conformity that followed after World War II. And that's a lot of reason the counterculture happened in the first place, was a reaction against just how conformist the U.S. was at the time. I'm not sure... A lot of folks today recall or appreciate how incredibly conformist the U.S. could be. In this the is 50s like during the late 40s and 50s. Yeah, exactly. And so much of the counterculture was a reaction against that. Mm. And, um, and, of course, it was the Cold War. And also, I'm not sure a lot of people today can appreciate the, the incredible chilling effect that the Cold War had and how, you know, it was just we were taught to think that every day was a battle for survival. We did um, nuclear fallout drills in my elementary school, duck and cover. Right? I remember. You remember. Yeah, see, and a lot of folks, I mean, just, so there was that presence that, like, yeah, nuclear war could happen any day. The Russians could bomb us any day, right? And it was just, it was really oppressive, you know? And a lot of people were rebelling against that and saying, no, there's different ways. So that's all the context, but... I um, I basically, you know, transitioned out of the family home and out of the family business and right into what was left of a lot of the dissident movements in the late seventies and early eighties. So how how did you uh, um, how did you get into the cooperatives mm -hmm. as uh, as not yeah. only a lifestyle but as as uh, yeah you the the way you've uh, fed yourself. Well, and it, it started with, the, you know, being comfortable with business in the family business and then getting into the food co-op. And through the food co-op, I found more radical collectivist uh, projects. And one of the things I hit once I, you know, I moved into D.C. in 1980. And one of the things that made me feel different then was I had business experience and I was, you know, understood customer relations. I knew how to sell a good or a service to a customer. I had learned all that stuff, right? And and I was accustomed to what was essentially a freelance lifestyle at that time. But most of the folks I was hanging out with in these like radical collectors in DC, middle class, upper class, educated, not but no business experience. People who were more academically inclined or artistically inclined or uh, inclined towards literature or fine arts. Or, but they were not business people. And so this was something that was a little strange to them. And I remember having debates about the environmental movement with these folks and saying, look, you know, we need, you know, this is a false framing how the environmental movement, and especially I was wrapped up in the radical environmental movement, you know, 
the economy is not our enemy. We have to find a way to get our economy and the environmental movement aligned. And that's going to be the key to, you know, the, the environmental movement for actually prevailing. They thought I was crazy. They would literally laugh at me when I said that. But there were some people back then who were just beginning to say the same thing. And, you know, it's the beginning of the green business movement mm -hmm. and um, sustainable economics, right? But that was a foreign concept to most people, including very advanced thinkers in the movement were not thinking in terms of sustainable economics. It was much more about, you know, we need stronger government regulations, blah, 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 you know, and uh, it just, you know, so that, that the alignment of progressive values with economics, you know, for the progressive movement to actually have a strong economic program, that's just not where they were at. They were still, they were still getting over, you know, Stalinism, basically. Right. They were still shaking that off in a lot of ways and finding a better way. And so, um, so that was, you know, that was sort of how I was um, different then. But that also naturally meant that we could find common ground in something like Mondragon, you know. And my affinity group studied Mondragon in 1982 or so. This BBC documentary about Mondragon came out and we screened it in our collective. And... And that was a very validating moment for me because we looked at each other and we were like, "This is it. Mm -hmm. This is we we have an economic model that we can all believe in as progressives, right? And it's already happening, right? It isn't like some theory, mm -hmm. right? It's this this thing is vibrant and it's functioning and it's a regional economic democracy. You know, this is where it's at. So then I started reading more about the collectives in Spain during the Spanish Civil War and and um, realized that they're there really is, you know, this is a model. This is a model. And um, so that that went from there, you know, and I went through the 80s and continued to operate in a number of collectivist efforts and did a little bit of consulting to my local food co-op. And um, But there was a lot going on, and it was the Reagan era, the Reagan-Bush era. Um, there was, you know, the, the um, uh, up until the end of the Cold War, what really diverted us was, um, you know, trying to stop nuclear war. That was kind of an all-consuming effort that didn't leave a lot of room for long-term sustainable economic planning. We were just trying to make sure the world didn't end tomorrow. And so when the Cold War ended in the late, late 80s, early 90s, I think the... 89 was the... Uh, Berlin Wall. Berlin Wall came down, and I think the Soviet Union collapsed not long after, right? And so that really changed the equation for progressives a lot in the U.S. And it was disorienting in a way, but it also opened up a lot of space in the activist sphere. If we were like, okay, you know, nuclear war is looking a, a lot less like a threat. And so maybe we can focus on ecological sustainability. Maybe we can focus on longer term things now about, you know, how do, and then sustainable economics started rising. And so I did a lot of reflecting in the early 90s. I had to do a lot of shifting of gears myself, but um, I, was, I was freelancing. I got into computers. Um, I basically, you know, just... I, I had my family business was electronics, so I had been making a living as an electronics freelance electronics technician for a while, and that naturally got me into doing freelance computer tech support, pretty gracefully. That was about the mid '80s, um, but I was always what really drove me into that was how can we use technology to help activist movements, to help progressive movements, and um, that fit in nicely with the cooperative sector, actually, because there were a lot of co-ops, especially food co-ops, that were growing. The, the, the food co-op movement, what we call the third wave of the co-op movement, happened, started in the 70s, the mid-70s, and continued very quickly um, to grow consistently in through the 90s and beyond. And, and in, in an activist context, that's unusual because, you know, I got in, you know, deeply involved in different movements in the late 70s, but those movements were also in the process of shrinking, and the country was in the process of swinging right and electing Reagan twice and 
bush once after that, bush 41 after that. And so the country was moving right, all these progressive movements were really shrinking. They're all through the 80s, into the 90s. But what I discovered in the early to mid 90s was that the cooperative movement was growing. And it took me a while for that to show up on my radar, but like I say, after the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was an opportunity to think more long term as an activist. And I did a lot of reflecting and I looked back on what are my strengths, what am I good at, what comes naturally to me, what, is, what am I naturally passionate about. And I came, I came back to progressive activism and sustainable economics, green economics. So you've been thinking long term mm. for a long time. Yeah. That was always part of your, your mm -hmm. modus operandi. Yeah. Not just in terms of the issue. Right. Right, very much. And, and like I say, the, you know, the potential for nuclear war was largely a distraction. And I always felt that way through the 80s when I was in my 20s. It was like, all we're doing here is trying to prevent disaster. We're not really building a sustainable society with what we're doing. We're reacting to an emergency. And so when we had the opportunity to actually do some long-term planning, I went right back to my roots. And that naturally led me back to the Mondragon mm -hmm. example and food cooperatives. And I realized this is, you know, this is my chance to actually start building something instead of fighting something, right? Is it, so is that when you got in, uh, started uh, mm. the uh, tech worker cooperative? Yeah, I, um, it's, it was uh, a great example of how getting deeply involved in one co-op leads you to other types of co-ops because in the mid-90s I started, decided to volunteer at my food co-op. I was like, where should I go from here, you know? I want to get back to like, you know, pushing on sustainable business because that's something I can contribute that still a lot of people aren't elevating, aren't lifting up. And what can I bring to it? I can bring tech skills, right? And so I started volunteering at my food co-op and right away they were like, oh my God, we need so much computer help, right? And so they needed a lot more computer help than I could give them volunteer, actually. So they were like, okay, we'll pay you. So that became like my first long-term consulting gig to a co-op was doing tech support, computer tech support for my local food co-op. Mm -hmm. And they needed a lot of help. And so that just went on and on. And it turns out, like so many co-ops at the time, this was the mid-90s, they needed to expand. They were bursting at the seams. They had way more business than their little store could handle, and they needed to open a bigger store. And that meant and they were wisely realized they needed to get to a point of sale system they needed networked computers they needed to you know develop all those skills as an organization in order just to manage their own growth and so um you know i there were some things like i didn't know a whole lot about point of sale systems but i knew a lot about computers in general and databases in general so i struck a deal with them i was like look you know i'm going to be learning on the job but I'll give you a low rate. And they were like, that's great, because we can't afford to pay, you know, a full rate. And so I worked for them for years, you know, probably often 30, 40 hours a week as a somewhat low-paid contractor. And um, got deeply into food co-op, point-of-sale systems, IT systems. And one of the reasons I got into IT in general, as, I've, as an activist, I was always interested in what makes an effective organization. And one of the best ways to build a really good understanding of organizations is to study their information processes, right? When, you're, when you are an IT consultant to a small organization, you learn everything about their organization because mm -hmm. you have to track how in every piece of information flows through the organization. So it's one of the best ways to get into organizational development is through IT. So when you were uh, uh, this... Uh, uh uh, long-term consult consultancy with the, the yeah. food co-op. Mm -hmm. is, is that when you started your own business? Mm. And, and so that was what, about mid-90s? or? Yeah, that was mid to late 90s. And you could say that's, I mean, I had been freelancing before that. I did a stint for a few years as a headhunter for computer programmers, and that would teach me so that I could learn about the computer industry. As a freelance electronics technician, you know, I just 
m usually through word of mouth or connecting with different people. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that was really when it it became this solid full time gig for me doing you know consulting to a co op full time and. <clears throat> Networking with other food co-ops, one of the great advantages of the co-op sector is co-ops don't compete with each other, they help each other, right? And so I plugged into that network of food co-op IT people, which was national, and that was extremely useful for learning things and get connecting me to other co-ops and giving me a sense of the larger movement. And then another thing happened that was very important, which was there was a small software company just a couple blocks away from my food co-op. And they became aware of my work at the food co-op because they were shopping there. And I, you know, uh, made a connection with them, got acquainted with them, developed some rapport. They were a growing company and they had a small tech support division, right? And they, they were having a lot of success on the software development front, but they still had some tech support customers. They started farming out their tech support work to me. And that went on for a year or two. It worked out really well. And... Then they, then they really they needed a programmer, and I had been, one part of my freelance work had been building websites in the in the mid '90s too. When, when the web came along, I looked up some of my old radical friends, and we were all thinking the same thing. We were like, let's get into building websites. So, in addition to all this other stuff I was doing, I was building websites on the side with some of my old friends, and um, so I had some skill building websites, which was in those days was really not that complicated. It was, you know, the te technology was new, and you could really pick it up pretty quickly if you were already a tech. And um, so, so they, so this little software company, they took me on as a contract programmer for a few months, uh, helping them build websites. It's a steep learning curve, but they were coaching me on a lot of stuff. And the fact that I already had a business relationship with them, they knew they could trust me. They knew I was committed to quality work, and so they, you know gave me a long runway in which to, you know, come up to speed on this really rather sophisticated website programming that they were doing. And um, <clears throat> and so then that went on for a few months. Everybody was happy, but at one point they said, you know, this is great, but we're paying you like 50 bucks an hour and we can't afford to keep doing that and we want to hire you instead as a W-2. And up until that point, I had never been a full-time W-2 in my whole life. I had just always been a freelancer occasionally some part-time w-2 stuff here and there but but uh and so i was like well i don't usually do that you know mm -hmm. i'm just that's not my thing right and they knew my history with my family business and everything so i said <clears throat> look but i will consider becoming a full-time w-2 and taking a significant pay cut going to a w-2 as instead of a contractor but i want an equal share of the business you know, I'm accustomed to owning my own business, and that's what's, that's really what's going to be valuable to me. And you can pay me less money if you make me a co-owner. And so they said, well, you know, that's really interesting because we have wanted to become a democratically owned business. And we're already sort of informally democratically worker managed, but we want to formalize worker ownership. We don't even know how to do that. And I said, well, have you looked at becoming a worker co-op? like Mondragon. And they said, what's a worker co-op? What's Mondragon? And so I was like, well, okay, you know, I can, I can talk you through this. I can coach you in this. And so this was your first development job as well? Well, you could say it was my first worker co-op development job. Absolutely. You could say I was doing food co-op development on the IT side okay. already, right? Because you know, you do IT, you're going to end up doing business development too, right? So, but yeah, this was my first worker co-op development project was a conversion of the company that I had just joined. Mm -hmm. So they hired me on, we had some very vague plans about what we wanted, and we basically, we started writing bylaws and, you know, coaching everybody through that process. And fortunately, I was already familiar with the process of food co-op bylaws, and it wasn't that different. So... We got some help from the ICA group, and um, they, they actually gave us model bylaws to work from. So that was a huge leap forward. But it took a long time, partly because this little software company was having, like, explosive growth. And we went from, I was, I was worker number four, and within two years we had hired three more people. 
so we went from four to seven in like a year and a half or something. And so, um, so we had, you know, Mondragon has that motto, we build the road as we travel, right? right. And so that's exactly what we were doing. This, this little company was traveling fast. It was growing fast. And we were building out this worker co-op infrastructure at the same time. So it was a lot of multitasking, um, a lot of work, and just a lot of having to talk things through because the whole workplace, how workplace democracy actually works and what do you do in this situation, what do you do in that situation, it was a lot, of, a lot to work out, but we did. We worked it out, so, you know, that was my first conversion and my first worker co-op and my first worker co-op development experience all in one. And how long, how long was that? Uh... Mm. You in, uh, were you in that business? I was there for 10 years total. Okay. And um, then um, the founder of the business stayed on for a couple of years after we converted to full democratic, every worker is equal, worker ownership. And um, But after, when he left after a couple of years, they wanted me to become president. And I was like, eh, I'll become president as long as it's strictly a ceremonial position. There's no authority involved. So I spent the last three years there as president. Um, and, and but, go ahead. But it was the leadership role. It was a leadership role. What that really meant was I didn't have any power, but when there were pissed off customers on the phone or when government officials or lawyers called up, they would say, oh, please hold, I'll connect you to the president, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like, Jim, there's a live one coming in, right? So I'm like, great. Okay, but that actually, that has a value. Sometimes, you know, it helps people to know that they're talking to the president and they become more reasonable, even though push come to shove, I would say, well, actually, you know, we have a seven-way partnership and <laughs> every, every worker here is an equal owner, so it's really a partnership you're dealing with. And they're like, oh. So... So, uh, you uh, transitioned out of that business. Mm -hmm. Did you transition into worker co-op development? Or actually, maybe cooperative? Actually, you've been doing cooperative development because yep. you were working with the book yep. co-op. So, did you just transition into mm -hmm. that as a full-time? One of the things that happened, I had a number of clients when I joined the software company. And one of them was the food co-op. And, um, and so when I joined the software company, I brought my clients to the software company and told my clients, all right, you can still use me, but you're going to be billed through my company now, through this new company that I'm working with. And everybody's like, cool with that. So we c I continue to consult to the food co-op through the software company, and that eventually became actually management consulting. It didn't. It, it eventually it expanded out of just strictly IT, and the general manager there used me to do basically do management consulting and do things like designing and filling new positions and things like that, and and essentially overseeing the IT department of the co-op in some important ways, um, because um, IT departments can be very difficult to manage, um, because mo in the food co-op sector. Very few workers in the food co-op really understand what the IT people are doing. And so it can be difficult to make sure they're actually working on the most important stuff, using their time effectively, things like that, and, and you know, solving the problems they're supposed to solve. So I continue to consult to the co-op through my software company. Um, and the also, you know, I, I one day I was... We were talking about how we needed an attorney who was savvy with co-ops. We had an attorney, but we weren't happy with him. We had a CPA. We weren't happy with our CPA. They didn't get us, really. And so it was difficult to work with them because they didn't really understand our priorities or our culture. And so I was like, all right, damn it. I'm going to find a lawyer who actually you know, aligns with our values. Where do I go for this? Well, I start talking to other worker co-ops. Let me find the other worker co-ops in our region and see which lawyer they're using, right? And I got feedback. Most of them I talked to were like, hey, we're unhappy with our lawyer too. If you find a good one, let us know, okay? But in the course of that, I found the Geo Collective website. And I was out there on the web searching around and I found the Geo website. And I, 
and that's how I ended up joining the Geo Collective. This you joined about two thousand five, or yep, okay, two thousand five, and I I didn't know about the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy. I was not in the loop in the worker co-op movement that much, mm -hmm. and um, and so it was members of the Geo Collective that told me about that conference, and so in two thousand five I flew to New Hampshire and went to this conference and it just totally blew my mind that the sector was that organized and I was able to connect with all these different worker co-op people including other worker uh, IT worker co-ops and it was just the whole universe opened up for me at that point and 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 that conference actually had a track by the ICA group the whole track in the conference was about how to start a worker co-op and so five years after we after I had joined the software company and started the conversion process, I finally went through a formal training course for starting a worker co-op, which was extremely enlightening. It was very, very helpful. And, um, and, th and that kind of plugged me into this national network. And um, I found out that just a year before, the, um, the U.S. Federation had been founded, and there was this national federation, too. And so that was extremely important. And then a really funny thing happened not long after that, which was um, a, a woman who was the executive director of a national network of co-op developers called our worker co-op with a request for some software development. There was a software application that she wanted to develop for this network, and this was Cooperation Works. And, um, and, sh and she consulted with us at length about how to build a software application that would benefit co-op developers and make their lives easier. And it's through this process, through that contact, I became aware that there was this national network of co-op developers and that they had a training program. And so in 2006, I signed up for that training program. And it was um, a total of three sessions over a year. And through that, and it took took a couple weeks off to two one-week sessions and I took a couple weeks off at different times flew to Madison or drove to Madison I forget which I think I drove to Madison and um, spent a week with co-op developers from all over the country and people learning to be co-op developers and became aware of this whole network of co-op development centers and the funding where they get their funding and how they do it these are cross-sector co-op developers so they, this is all yeah. peer to peer learning Yes, and sometimes... You're just immersed in it. Some, yes, exactly. That's, I'm glad you're taking it back to that. So the peer-to-peer -peer learning, the conference connected me with other worker owners and other worker co-ops. Cooperation Works connected me to other co-op developers. A peer-to-peer -peer between developers, not between worker owners. Mm -hmm. But very much about peer learning. Yes, so it's totally... And, you know, it's worth noting that it's pretty much the way I've always learned because, you know, there wasn't money for college in my family, right? There was the family business instead. My family didn't send me to college, right? And so, but, and it was, the family business was very much do-it-yourself. I mean, it was electronics, and the field of electronics was constantly evolving. And so, very much like in the IT industry, the electronics industry in the 70s and 80s was evolving very quickly. We were still, when I started fixing televisions in the mid-70s, we were just starting to get away from vacuum tubes. And we were just starting to see all these completely solid state televisions. And my father was bewildered by these. He was a vacuum tube guy. And so he threw a few books at me and said, learn transistors, right? And I went through the books and I had televisions that I could practice on. So I, I learned electronics basically from books and from this vacuum tube guy who sort of understood solid state a so, little bit. <clears throat> so from the very, very beginning, yeah, your lived experience, yes, which is really what is, is uh, <clears throat> the power of uh, uh, people of peer-to-peer -peer learning. Yes. Everyone's working from lived experience. Exactly. You had it in running a business. Yeah. Of being part of a uh, of a business, knowing what, so it's, so you were a business person, right? Pure lived experience, yeah. Electronics, yeah. And uh, you mm -hmm. got immersed in cooperatives, yeah. In, in four or five different ways, yes. And then you got 
immersed in the, uh, a movement yes. about all of this. Yes. Uh, and draw that was drawing on you, uh, all your lived experience. And it's, it's it was a whole yeah a whole continuum yeah. of learning through lived experience. It's all it, practically every useful piece of learning that I've done. Everything I've ever learned has been experientially, and either by doing it or by you know collaborating with people who are doing it, sharing information and mutual coaching with people who are working from their lived experience, their experiential learning. And, you know, and like I say, the field of electronics growing quickly, IT growing quickly, co-ops growing quickly, and software is very much about this too, is it's changing so fast, the universities don't keep up very well. Right. You can only learn by doing it, really. And those few years I did as a headhunter, at one point I crunched the numbers and I realized that half of the really good computer programmers that I had ever placed did not have degrees. They were the nerds in school that had just, mm -hmm. you know, taught themselves, fiddle right. around with stuff. Right. The, the, um, the make, what we now call makers, okay? Right. And so it's all experiential learning. And, um, and if I have a bias, that's it, you know? It's like, it's, I, I, it's the type of learning that I value. And if you can imagine doing this up until the mid-90s, doing this without the net. It's got to be from books and personal connections and begging time from people who know more than mm -hmm. I do, mm -hmm. buying lunch, buying dinner for people who know more mm -hmm. than I do so they can let me pick their brains, right? And so it's very much about, you know, making those connections with people. And the field of co-op development and worker co-op development and peer-to-peer, -peer, of course, is very much about those relationships. And this very much <coughs> shaped your approach to uh, being mm -hmm. a cooperative developer. Yeah, very much, very much. And, and there's some tension around that, too, because there's co-op developers that come from the grassroots co-op organizing world, like me, and then there's also co-op developers who come to it through, you know, academic learning, through classroom learning, through their, they're in some other profession and they bridge over to co-op development, right? And so it's, and you, those folks are a maybe incorrectly, sometimes called the professional class developers, right? And then they come from a professional culture, as opposed to people like me who come from more of an organizing culture. You know, we see it needs to be done, we jump in and we figure out how to do it. And, you know, they, the experiential learners versus the maybe more so academy-type learners. What we have right now is a burgeoning, yeah. not only of worker cooperatives, but I think of the whole the whole field of cooperative solidarity economics or mm -hmm. alternative economics. Yep. It's it's, it's uh, and so the role of the developer becomes very key at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's more money coming in from cities. Yeah. There's more money coming in from the nonprofit world, mm -hmm. and maybe just from uh, individual or small group uh, philanthropists or what have you. And uh, so, how do you how do you and then mm. there's this tension between you've got two two different approaches to cooperative development yeah. that are in tension with each other, mm. and you're definitely mm. committed to yeah. a peer to peer yeah. development approach. Mm -hmm. As opposed to uh, mm. the expert, uh, 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 you might maybe yeah. you should you should characterize the other approach. Yeah, because you're more acquainted with it than I am. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, it's it's. I think it's important to. This is tricky, but I think it's true. It's not completely either or. In terms of who brings what value to the table, and when I was in. 2005, 2006, when I realized that, okay, there's this network of co professional co-op developers out there. There's a training course, the Cooperation Works Training. Pretty much the only place in the country at the time that you could be trained as a co-op developer. Mm -hmm. It was the only place to get it. And so I went there, right? 
and it was definitely a very different culture. There were people there who were grassroots like me, including the executive director of CW at the time. But there were people from many other cultures, and most of them were operating in rural areas because that's where the funding is for co-op development, or at the time, that's where most of the co-op development funding was and for it, rural co-op. It comes out of Roosevelt <coughs> program. Right. Okay, and comes PBA, out of, and they had yeah. a lot of... Uh, Money went into rural cooperatives, especially electric cooperatives. Right. Exactly, and then there was some kind of an agreement mm -hmm. with uh, that yeah. Roosevelt had had to make with uh, yeah. that we don't go into the cities because that's the capitalist territory. Yeah. There's kind of a division of the country. Yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how that fell out, but there was a key program that was instituted in 19, I believe it was 95. Um, <clears throat> called the Rural Cooperative Development Grant Program that was very special because it was millions of dollars being put directly into organizations that were doing rural co-op development. This money came out of the USDA. And a lot of it, it was built up around the Farm Bill, and there was a lot of activity around um, in the late 20th century about family farms and preserving the rural way of life. So there was a lot of political will to preserve rural economies. And that became, you know, millions of dollars from the federal government going directly to co-op development. And so that's where a lot of cooperation works came from, or most of it came from. But so the bottom line there, it was culturally very different. At the same time, they were very intrigued with worker co-ops. They were very interested in the prospects there. The more forward-thinking developers were very interested in, in worker co-ops. They saw the potential there. And <clears throat> so... So that was, and there was no training program, you know, this was it. And so, you know, I'm just enormously indebted to the folks that put together that Cooperation Works training program and the fact that participating in that program also gave me relationships with all those people mm -hmm. and plugged me into that network where I could get experiential learning, right? Mm -hmm. Where I could have colleagues where I can send them an email or call me, call them up and ask them questions and they'll talk to me for 20, 30 minutes or longer, right? They'll give me their time because I'm a developer too. And so for the, at that period, like the but mid... you were also, re it was a give and take. Oh, yeah. There were people who were calling you. And they would always make me their IT guy, you know? Whenever we got okay. together, it'd be like, Jim, you know, try to figure out how to make the projector work, right? It was okay. always like that, okay. okay? So there was a lot of give and take. And um, so... The bottom line there, though, is that there was this sc great scarcity of access to the process of becoming a co-op developer, and the CW training was it when I was starting out. Federation existed, but it was still getting on its feet, and, um, and that's one reason I, speaking of experiential learning, when the Federation in 2009... Uh, finally got to the point where it could mount its own training program for worker co-op developers, or what we call peer advisors. Um, that was like, that became the top priority in my life. You know, This is Don. This is Don. This is what became Don. In the beginning, and we... Don stands for? Democracy at Work Network. Okay. But the roots of it go back to 2004. At the very first national conference for worker co-ops, which I think was in Minnesota and um, in Minneapolis, I believe, and they, you know, they, they polled everybody, and they said, you know, what are our priorities? We now have a national federation. What, what are our priorities? And I think there were a half a dozen or so. Ajwa was there. She would know. But there were about a half a dozen priorities, and one of them was Worker Co-op Peer Technical Assistance Network. That was it. Right? And that was the, that was the magic phrase, mm -hmm. right? And so for the first year or two, Dawn's working title was actually Wikpatan, okay? <laughs> W-C-P-T-A-N. And, but that, that vision was right there, mm -hmm. right at 2004. And it took five years before the Federation could start bootstrapping that vision. But that was, it was right there, peer technical assistance. And so when that finally came to fruition, right, when Melissa Hoover convened, you know, picked 10 people, to convene nationally, I was one of those people. 
and um, because I'd been going to Federation events, I've been going to conferences, I was coaching people where I could, I met people like Tim Hewitt, right, and Margaret Bow, and other people who had actually been doing worker co-op development, Jim Megson from the ICA group, there were, you know, there weren't that many. There was this key moment, actually. This tells you the state of, the state of worker co-op development at the time was, uh, Margaret Bow was one of my trainers for the co-op in Cooperation Works, and that one, and she was the first person I had met who had started more than one worker co-op, and, and I said, and she had started a number of them. She was a full-time USDA employee doing co-op mm -hmm. development, and, and I said, how many people are there in the country? who have started more than one worker co-op. And she started counting them up on her fingers, okay? And it was like, oh, well, there's the ICA group, and there's Tim Hewitt, and there's herself, and maybe a few others. It was like, there's less than 15, 20 people in the country who have started more than one worker co-op. Blew my mind, right? And so this was like, this is, you this know... This is 2009? This is 2006, 2007. Okay. And um, it, was, it was just like, this is a tiny field, and yet it's incredibly important. It is so freaking important. And the, the lack of experience here is staggering. Mm -hmm. And speaking of experiential learning, right? So it's like, this has got to be like, for me, it was like, that is the top priority. And we've got all these worker owners out there who successfully started and run one worker co-op. And if they can get experience with one or two more worker co-ops, their universe of knowledge will increase tenfold, right? They'll get like a parallax, right? They'll, they'll have a very different experience starting another worker co-op and another worker co-op. And so their, their frame of reference will be much, much larger. And so experience is the essential quality, quantity here. Everybody, it's just... It remains the key thing is for people who want to get experience starting worker co-ops, they should be able to get it. But the hardest thing to teach is ownership culture, right? It's, and so, to me, the the this is why it's so important to press the model of worker owners becoming co-op developers or worker owners becoming what we call peer advisors gaining experience helping other worker co-ops because they already know the thing that is hardest to teach which mm -hmm. is what the culture is culture and and so you know if, if we're looking at how do we increase the capacity of knowledgeable people who can provide assistance in the country the quickest way to do that is to invest in worker owners people who already understand ownership culture because that's going to be the hardest thing to teach. Yep. And where, where, where co-op developers fall short, I think, is often because there are cultural dimensions to the people they're trying to help that they don't understand. And that's where I think co-op development falls short most often, is we don't actually understand the people we're trying to help. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, just a, a, a quick jump back. Um, mm -hmm. You said it's the, the fastest way to mm. develop yeah. the worker cooperatives. Is it just the fastest, or is it the, the, yeah. the yeah. deepest in the sense of... Yeah. I think it, it's, it's expedient, but I think it's also more effective. Um, and it's probably, I think, more empowering to the people we're trying to help. And I've experienced that with my experience with Dawn, with my experience of having been a worker owner, helping other worker owners, I feel like I get that again and again and again, right? There's, there's things they don't have to explain to me mm -hmm. about why they're doing it, about what they're doing, about the challenges they're having. There's all sorts of things that they're going through that I usually get right away. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a much higher quality experience for them. They develop more faith in the process. They therefore have more patience in the process. They become more invested in the process of working with an outside consultant. Um, when they sense that consultant is like, oh, they get us. They understand us. We feel safe with this person. We don't have to explain every little thing to them. We don't have to defend the way we're doing things. You know? And one thing that is, happens with practically every worker co-op and every startup group is 
there are some things that they're embarrassed about. Okay? There are always things that they feel inadequate about. And it's all of them. <laughs> it's like everybody goes through that. And it's not just worker co-ops, it's food co-ops. Everybody, everybody feels like they're, you know, being stupid about stuff. And so when they're sitting across the table from someone else who can actually talk to them about the stupid things that they did, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, we were just so naive and we did this and we should have done that. And here's we have this really painful lesson. So this is You where know, it's just you get that trust and rapport very quickly. Yeah. That, that image of sitting across the table from someone who is starting it up and they've got all of the... Uh, mm -hmm. I guess one of the primary things that they need... Yeah. is to develop their self-confidence. Totally. I'm not an idiot for trying to do this, et cetera, et cetera. They're always filled with self-doubt. And, and, and they're sitting across from someone who can tell them his or her story mm -hmm. of their struggle with self-confidence, mm -hmm. in which it resonates, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's where, it, where the trust begins to emerge. Exactly. Is, uh, is, is in that. And... Uh, it that yeah exchange yeah is so different from yes okay this is what you're supposed to do you do one two three four right and you have a you have a a, a, mm -hmm. a format laid out yeah and are you going through these steps yeah and it's not it, you know it's not really mm -hmm. the shared experience that right. that's that's underlying right it's there's a format, and this is a third objective for format that yeah. I'm looking at it. I'm guiding you into through that format, which is right. Not quite the same. Not much closer to a paternalistic model. Much. I am the okay. expert. I come in. I'm the person who knows how to do this. Okay. I will instruct you in how to do it. And you know, okay, that can work, but is it really solidarity? You know, so this comes back. The word solidarity brings us back to culture. Yeah, and I want to. I want to try to to concretize culture because yeah. uh, you know a lot of people think culture is uh, fine music, good wine. You know, <laughs> the arts, etc., which is great. I mean, they are, but we're talking here about about culture in the same way that uh, yeah. Tocqueville talked about it. Right. And um, I want to I, I want to bring democracy into this yeah. because that's kind of the whole thing I'm obsessed with. Mm. Uh, and I have I have uh, if there's any major discovery that I've made, it's making a distinction between culture and structure of democracy. Yeah, structure relates primarily to the way we govern. Mm -hmm. There's Congress, there's the, 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 the voting and the, the, all the legal things, etc., mm -hmm. etc. But democracy in terms of culture is the way we live and relate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the situation with uh, developing a worker cooperatives yeah. and their solidarity with others, yeah. if there isn't a real shared ways of thinking, living, working together and relating yeah then it's not going to it, it's going to have internal problems right and that i think that's the biggest thing that we struggle with throughout the movement mm -hmm. which is yeah we come from the big culture yeah which is a filled with a contradiction between for shorthand terms patriarchy and democracy, mm -hmm. and there is this this embattled contradiction between the two. It's in me, mm -hmm. and I see it in you, and I see mm -hmm. it, you know. Right. And if we aren't able to work with yeah. that embodied contradiction that's in our culture and is now inside us, right. then we're undermining our work constantly. Yeah. Because we're allowing this to go, and we don't even know mm -hmm. how we become paternalistic when all right. of a sudden, you know, there's a big gulf that's happened because right. we moved in that direction. Yeah. 
or if, if I understand you correctly, it's like we inadvertently recreate systems of oppression. Absolutely, that's what yeah. I'm. That's what I'm saying. Yes. In the in the context of the that word culture. Yes. Yeah, a huge problem, and I think none of us are immune. From no. <laughs> none of us is immune from that. It's it's just we have to assume that by default we will inadvertently recreate systems of oppression and we need to be vigilant and constantly trying mm -hmm. to improve our methods for checking ourselves on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's I, I think it's 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 a big topic and it can be hard to get your arms around, but I think that from the standpoint of movement I don't know if this is the direction we should go off in right now, but this is what's on my mind, is we need to look at in which models of development are we investing as a movement. Where are we putting our resources? We don't have enough resources. We can't put resources in all the places we should. We have to prioritize, right? So do we put resources into this grassroots, horizontal, peer-to-peer -peer model, which needs a lot of development, right? It, it can work very well, it has been working very well, but it, every model has its challenges and it needs more development. It, we, 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 just in the, you know, the 10 years that Dawn existed, right? We just kept getting better and better at doing what we were doing. So you're saying that the, the, uh Mm -hmm. The work of developing cooperatives yes. needs ongoing development. Because it, it's because it's still such a young, especially worker co-op right. development in this country, it's still a young practice. And it, it I've just I've watched it grow so quickly just in the last ten years. And it, it's grown by leaps and bounds and just in terms of methods and tools and and the and so it's there's so much to do there's so much potential and there's so much development of the development processes that is still needed and so it's it's a very very consequential decision about where are we putting our resources right do we take our very limited resources and put them into professional models of development so-called professional models right where uh, it's someone who has not been a worker owner necessarily, who doesn't necessarily get the culture, but they have very much of a, um, you know, more of a business school approach, right? M more of an ESOP approach, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Something that doesn't come from a horizontal democratic culture, that doesn't come from, you know, you're sharing power in a workplace. I mean, every worker in that place is also an owner, right? And you... Let's put it this way, you know, I think one of the fundamental differences is a healthy worker co-op runs on soft power, not hard power, mm -hmm. right? It runs on solidarity, right? That concept of, like, we're all equal owners, we share equally in the risk and the hardship, we share equally in the benefit and the surplus. And that is the, the core strategic advantage of worker ownership and workplace democracy. That's where it can outclass other types of business models, potentially. I don't hear people talk about this a lot. I think that worker-owned models can be a vastly superior model of enterprise. But it still needs development, right? We're still figuring out how to do workplace democracy in a lot of ways. There's some very good working models out there, but in terms of our ability to consistently and successfully implement workplace democracy again and again, predictably, that's still really challenging because so much depends upon the culture that you develop, the culture that the people bring in, okay? So there's a huge amount of development that's still needed, but, but the potential is enormous arising from this shared fate, shared risk, shared benefit model, but when you have hierarchy, when you have top-down, when your business, day-to-day -day business operation is running on hard power, not soft power, you lose that solidarity, you lose that sense of shared fate, or you lose a lot of it. And I'm not sure <clears throat> folks who haven't actually been in a workplace democracy, often, I don't, I get the impression they just don't understand that. 
they don't right. realize that that is that's the, that's the goose that lays the golden eggs. That, right? com- that comes back to the whole business of uh, of culture. Yeah, is that someone who has uh, their whole work career has been involved in a, a quote quote hard power mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what the, that's their lived experience. Right. It's maybe all that they know. And to right. to for someone uh, and 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 uh, I'm thinking of someone who 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 quote quote grew up in IBM. Yeah. And yeah. Just saw the contradictions. Yeah. And moved out and uh, started their own small software uh, uh, company right and tried to make it as 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 as, uh, as cooperative as uh, mm-hmm. as as they could mm-hmm. is a very unusual yeah. event because yeah. it really takes a lot yeah to be able to see the culture that's shaping you yeah and knowing that, that mm-hmm. there has to be an alternative yeah. and that's a major that's a major shift in one's uh, awareness. Yeah. So it's very difficult to expect someone right. raised in that to, to see to, to yeah. see the difference. Yes, exactly. So, j- just to kind of uh, pull some of the pieces together in in what you've been saying, uh, as I've been hearing it, um, you're seeing the entire mm. worker co-op movement. And I'm going to extend it to the cooperative solidarity movements because they're all pretty much in the same in, in the same thing. They they operate off of solidarity, mm-hmm. and uh, and they're all new, and they have this whole cultural development thing that, that is is core to the to to, uh, to all of their work. Mm-hmm. But you see the whole Magello mm-hmm. mm-hmm. as developmental. Here we are at this stage, yeah. and just, just yeah. keeping it in terms of the worker co-op. It wasn't in t- ten years ago yeah. that we had a real conscious, focused, organized approach mm-hmm. to developing worker cooperatives, right. or it reached a new level of coherence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's not old at all. No. That means we're really early in the game. We're babies. We're babies, and yeah. so there is so much more development that has to yeah. go on. Yeah, and it's like if I were someone brand new and mm. and eighteen years old instead of seventy seven or yeah. twenty years old or twenty five, and I entered the movement, you know, yeah. out of for some reason whatever that might be, I'm entering something in which. My fullest, my, my fullest engagement is one in which I'm going to let myself be opened up to becoming a worker owner, mm-hmm. to supporting and building that uh, uh, worker co-op, to connecting locally with all the other ones, mm-hmm. to how can we develop. Th- I should be thinking developmentally across the board. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the, 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 mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the gist of what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, well, and as a movement, I think that's what we need to be looking at, because there is so much more development that is needed. The resources are so scarce, and so what are our priorities, right? In which model should we be investing in order to realize the long-term, very real strategic advantages that are possible for us, right? And it's tough. You know? And and at the core of this development, if it's going to stay rooted in democracy yeah. and in cooperation mm-hmm. and solidarity, the peer-to-peer yeah. exchange, learning, advising, yeah. whatever, the peer-to-peer is 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 the dynamo. It I, it's it is the essence of our strategic advantage, and not just the strategic superiority of our model but the just and sustainable superiority of our model, right? And so it's all, and, and I mean, it's the key is that the, the, the interests of the individual worker are actually aligned with the interests of the organization. I mean, how many organizations can you say that about, 
Okay? And so the trouble is, in a way, this is the trouble of success. If you want to say what's happening in the last 10 years since Evergreen is the mainstreaming of the worker co-op movement. Okay? And so culturally, think of what mainstreaming means. It, we're, we're going to come right up against the cultures of funders, governments, nonprofit organizations, other types of businesses, investors... Okay, we're going to come up against those cultures, which by and large are hard power cultures, right? And so, how do we do that without getting co opted? Mm -hmm. You know, if we're getting funding from those entities, support from those entities, if they're praising us, right? Then, how do we do that without buying into their power structure? I right? think that really points to the, to the real necessity of the our personal development. Of, of, of all of us in the movement because mm -hmm. we need to be at a place where we are internally very aware yeah. of how I can be co-opted right. and be very in tune with that so right. that I can maintain yeah. I, I can see how yeah. I'm starting to be uh, uh, attracted down those lines and, and we're all on a slippery slope because most of us, if not all of us have grown up in that hard power dynamic. And we need to not kid ourselves that, you know, I would argue that probably every single one of us in the movement, no matter how committed we are, we're still at risk for the slippery slope of hard power, top down, you know, imposed hierarchy. Um, and um, hard, just we're always at risk for that. And so we will continue, all of us will continue to be at risk for that. It's almost like it's an eternal vigilance situation. We've got to be holding that line all the time. We've got to be rigorous in our self-evaluations and our internal movement critique. And we need to recognize that that's the risk. You know, that we have this goose that lays golden eggs. It's a precious thing that I'm not sure anything else in the U.S. economy really has something like this. Right? Enterprises. I don't think, you know, I think... The worker co-op movement may be genuinely unique within the U.S. economy in that it is its strength is in soft power, and I just I don't not sure we could say that about any other organizations, and that means that ethic is always at risk for being dissipated as we form more connections to these organizations outside of our movement. So, just to kind of put the bow on this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the worker cooperative movement, in your view, has reached a point of development in, in terms of uh, a cooperative democratic mm -hmm. dynamics mm -hmm. and culture. It's reached a point to where it has a very strong responsibility to influence mm -hmm. the other cooperative sectors because we have this 10 years running yeah. of the peer-to-peer -peer yeah. cooperative development. In, in the formal form that the Federation did, of course, peer-to-peer co-op development has been going on forever. Yeah, right? well, it, yeah it, it's it, ancient. Right. It built the movement, really. Right. But, you know, in terms of formal organization, yes, we formalized it starting 10 years ago. Exactly. Right. And, and, and uh, we're learning how to do it more and more and more and that's yes. something that can be transmitted to other cooperative sectors. Yes, exactly. And we should acknowledge organizations like No Boss and VOC that were doing it before the Federation existed even. I think VOC might have come along shortly after, but I believe VOC existed before Dawn, and mm -hmm. they were doing it before Dawn. And No Boss, of course, goes way back in that. But yeah, that, but that's. I feel like that's really, in a sense, it's what we have uniquely to offer. And it's also at the heart of what of our strength, I think, of what we what we really could make us different, or could continue to make us different, and could continue to make us more just and sustainable. Um, but we have to we have to lift it up. We have to value it, and we have to make it a priority to invest in the model. Jim. Hey. Thank you very much. This has been a great conversation. Always love to And uh, we've been working together for 10 years mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, uh, really the first in-depth uh, 
exposure I've had to how this, how your whole life is, is wrapped up in this, mm-hmm. and and I really appreciate it. Glad to do it. Thank you for listening. Check us out at geo.coop. <laughs>